The following interview is being conducted with Mr. Adrian Sines for the Latino Americans 500 Years of History Grant Project at Oklahoma State University. The interview will become part of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the Edmund Lowe Library on the Stillwater campus of Oklahoma State University. The interview is taking place on Friday, July 14, 2016 at the Edmund Lowe Library in Stillwater, Oklahoma. The interviewer is Victor Dominguez Baeza, Director of Library Graduate Services. Hello, and thank you for agreeing to participate in this oral history project, Mr. Sines. Thank you for having me. I want to remind you that this interview may be published as part of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and that you have granted us permission to publish the transcript and video in part or in its entirety. <laughs> okay, so first off, can you give me um, sort of a little biographical information about yourself, so your name, uh, okay. where you were born, that kind of stuff? So my name's Adrian Alonso Sines. Um, Adrian was originally given to me because my mom really, really liked the name. Uh, Alonso was given to me in honor of my grandfather, and signs came from my father. Uh, I was born in Oklahoma City, okay. Uh, there's a funny little joke in the sense that whenever I was born, my brothers and sisters joke around that immediately after I was born, my mom went back to work. That's how things were back then. But <laughs> since then, uh, I've traveled through a variety of different schools. Uh, my parents actually came from Julimes, Chihuahua. Uh, my dad was originally the first to cross the border. Uh, after he was being, he, he actually he got after he got kicked out from his home at the age of thirteen. He then came to the U.S., spent some time here, made some money, and then went back and collected my mom, and then came back over here. Um, by that time, my two older siblings, uh, actually, my four old, older siblings, they were all kind of born in Mexico. So whenever the, the transition over here came, they had to apply for citizenship. And the bright side, they are already have it now. Uh, me and my, my youngest sister, Vicky, which I'm the baby, so she's like the youngest of the, the four sisters. Um, we were born here, so we, we had a lot more benefits. We started kind of like, what is it, Midtown, Oklahoma City. From there, we went to Gatewood. Then we transferred to like the South, went to Jefferson for a couple years in middle school. And then we finished up our last middle school and like high school in Dove Science Academy, Oklahoma City. And that's really like where I'm from, a nice combination of the two. Um, it was, it's not a bad place to grow up in Oklahoma City, but I'm definitely excited towards like expanding out and then eventually coming back to Oklahoma. So you mentioned one of your names came from your grandfather, mm -hmm. Alfonso? Alonso. Alonso. Uh, so tell me something about your grandfather. I've, I've, I know very little on my grandfather. Um, Within like Hispanic culture, they have the masculine identity. So from what I know, um, my family was a little bit more close to my grandma. Uh, my grandfather, on the other hand, had a bad reputation, and he would fight with my dad, and he would go and he would drink, and then he, I mean, he kicked my my dad out, out at the age of thirteen. So I know very little about him, but I know that whenever I was born, my dad made it a note to necessarily give me that name in honor of him. So it's, it's still a little bit of a mystery. So uh, where did you say your parents were from? Julimes, Chihuahua. And um, when did they come to the United States? <sighs> the exact numbers escape me. But, um, I mean, for me, growing up in the U.S., I, I never really, like, prioritized, like, knowing whenever my parents came over. What really mattered to me was the fact that they came over and I, I have these experiences and these, um, what is it, privileges that not everybody else has. So I don't, I don't really like to think too much about the past. So what was your father's name? Or what is your father's name? Nicolás Alonso Sainz. And your mother? Well, her, her name originally was Eduiges Pando. Um, but, I mean, Eduiges, whenever you, you pronounce it in, in English, Eduiges is kind of hard. So she actually got her name changed, and she's now Vicky Pando. And uh, do you know how they met? Well, they, they grew up together. I know, I know they, they've told me about one of their dates. Um, from my understanding is my dad went and then he came back and he was like, in the, he was more in the city and he really wanted to impress my mom. So he like rented out these two horses and at the time they went out like horseback riding. Actually it was one horse, they rented one horse and they went out horseback riding and where where would now be like the baseball stadium of, of the of the nice little town, 
and like whenever he would he would ride it, my mom well, she knew how to she knew how to ride horses, so she was just like all peaceful because she knew my dad didn't know. So whenever my dad decided to like let her switch, she booked it. And like the the joke is that by the time they finished riding, my dad had lost about almost everything that he had on, with the exception of his clothes. So like his wallet, his like his watch, his hat, it was all gone. And it's just it's hilarious. That's funny. Um, so, you were said, where were you born again? In Oklahoma City. And what year was this? This was in May 24th, 1993. So the year of the rooster, according to the, the Zodiac calendar. So what was it like growing up there? Um, it was peaceful. I mean, I, I, I never really retained a lot of my uh, baby memories. Like, my sisters, for whatever reason... They can't necessarily remember all these things. Like, I, I used to have, like, the world's biggest, like, teddy bear, and I would never let it go. Um, I used to be a chunky baby, and they used to nick nick nickname me the Michelin Man because I was just, like, so chunky. Um, but, I mean, I only really remember things because, like, they kind of, like, rub it in my face. Besides that, I mean, it's kind of one of those things within your mind that if you don't really use it, you lose it. So... I mean, I imagine it was peaceful. I don't, I don't have any like any traumas or anything. So it was, it was, it was a good childhood. I just, I just can't remember it. <laughs> so, so what's your earliest memory? Um, that one would have to be around the time of my well, kindergarten actually. Uh, reason being, it was like the first day of class, um, and I didn't want to go to the class mostly because um, there's some stuff that went down in like pre-K that I'm not too proud of. But uh, I remember, like, they, my mom taking me to class, and it was Mr. Ford's kindergarten class, and I was scared, and, like, and, like I, was, I was latched on to my mom. Next thing you know, like, the professor, I'm not the professor, the, the teacher recognizes this and, like, takes out this massive bucket of, like, plastic dinosaurs. I walk, and, like, I get distracted by, like, the dinosaurs. Next thing you know, I turn around, and my mom has already booked it down the hall. I'm, like, crying my heart out. And she's gone. But, I mean, they brought out yet another bucket of dinosaurs, and then, like, I was okay. <laughs> so, it was interesting. Um, they tell me, this is another one of the memories, um, I never really went to... It's, it's pre-K that comes before kindergarten, right? Pre-K. Um, I went one day. Um, and for whatever reason, this is, this is what they tell me, but for whatever reason, whenever we went to, like, recess, there's these two girls that were following me. And, like, I didn't like it. So I went to, like, the sandbox and, like, got some sand in my pocket. And, like, the girls came over and then I ran away. And I went up to the top of the slide and, like, they kept following me, except this time I was waiting. And whenever they made it to the top, I got the sand out of my pockets, threw it in their face, and then slid down. And then afterwards, like, I ran to my mom and I told her I never wanted to go to pre-K again. And I never did. So... That's that's I don't remember that I I I, I, don't, I don't I don't even think that even happened but that's what they tell me. So, uh, did you have any brothers? Yeah, actually, the way that it worked out, it was um, I'm the youngest of six, so we have the first four. Then there's like an, a nice little gap between the the first four and the the last two. Um, it started off with my sister Alma, then my sister Diana, then my sister Mayra, then my brother Alex. Eight and a half years later, my sister Vicky, and then me. So there's a, there's a nice little decade in terms of like time between my brother and me. So it's it's pretty interesting. And you mentioned before that uh, when your family moved here, that they had to apply to mm -hmm. become citizens. Do you know anything about the process they went through? I know my mom was the first. Um, I mean, from I don't, I'm not necessarily like a ton. I know that it consisted of an application, of a fee, of waiting, a test, passing the test, and then the ceremony. Uh, I mean, it's it's been pretty consistent. I imagine that it's changed in terms of, like, the waiting time since now and then. Because back then, I mean, it wasn't too much of, like, a big priority to allow people to get citizenship. But, I mean, for the most part, it was, it was pretty standard. But th then again, this is coming from, like, a kid who doesn't remember, so... <laughs> So when you were uh, growing up, do you remember, was was your family involved in like the Hispanic community in Oklahoma City? Uh, well, I don't think so. I, well, they were involved, like we knew people 
okay, we'll go back to, because it, it all it all revolves around my mother. Um, my mother has always been a smart cookie. Um, she had always wanted to be her self-employed. I mean, she was the oldest of thirteen. Um, there's one or two that died, but she still had to take care of everybody else. So she had always been working since like the longest time. Whenever it came down that she moved to the U.S., she was looking towards like how can she like contribute to the household. Um, and there's pretty there's this pretty interesting story of how she became a realtor. So originally she really wanted to become a realtor because she liked the idea of going like interacting with people and like selling them houses. But my dad, going back to that masculinity idea, would not let her become self-employed. So she got her license and then she went to go work for like a nice little company. Um, well, it turns out that back then, I mean, you would make three percent com commission off of a house. You would keep one point five. You'd yeah, you'd keep one point five, and the the company would keep the other half. So she was smart about this, and she knew this. So she she strategically planned around this. So whenever she sold her first house, she got a nice little check. Um, I don't know what it like translates to back then, but she has she got a nice little check, and uh, instead of like putting it and saving it away. She went, got it cashed, and immediately went to a country and western store. She bought two pairs of boots, two pairs of pants, two belts, a couple shirts, a couple hats. Um, and, like, she just had this all strategically, like, placed in my dad's, like, in, in, the, in, their, in their bedroom for whenever my dad came home. So she, she got it all taken care of. She bought it. Boom, she put it there. Um, and she waited. Well, eventually, my dad came home, and then, like... He, he was tired, but my mom was like, hey, I sold my first house today, and I bought you something. Go check it out in the room. And he goes, and he sees all these, all the, all the, all the things uh, with the rave back then. Um, and, like, he's super excited. And then this is where my mom is it was very, very smart. She, she, she's like, do you like him? She's like, yeah. he said, yeah, yeah, I love it. And I'm like, well, I want you to know that if I was my own company, I could have bought you twice this amount. And my dad, thinking on the moment, is like, "Oh, what are you thinking about? Go get your license. Go, go, go be, go, go get it done." And like that's really where it took off. Like my mom then uh, got everything taken care of, started her own firm. She she then moved on to like taxes, to accounting, to insurance, to Herbalife. She's done a variety of things. She's a little entrepreneur. Um, but within those interactions, like all her clients, she's she's met a variety of different people within like the Hispanic community in Oklahoma. Um, so they all come and then I'm, I'm, a, I have a little bit of fame because of my mom and cause like, Oh, look, is this your son? I'm like, yeah. Like, I remember whenever you were this high and like you had diapers and like, you were so cute. Look at you now. I don't know what happened. Uh, I'm just playing. <laughs> but, um, they just, they, they, they really enjoyed that aspect. Like I, 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 people know me because of my mom, because I was younger growing up cause she like her office was in the house. And then she eventually moved over to a, to a nice little office apartment, and it's it's been interesting. So through her work, she's in, she's been involved with the community in terms of like helping people get necessarily loans for houses, getting things taken care of, like understanding the system. But like as like a strong advocate within other regions. So let's say within the Hispanic community, we have like church. Church is big within like our community. Um, I don't really. I I mean I I was baptized. But I haven't done my first communion nor my confirmation. So it's just like, because she always devoted so much time towards working, she, did, she didn't really get a chance to like necessarily be there or like take me to church or things like that. And I think my sister is a little bit different, mostly because she completed all that things whenever she went to a private university. But I mean, it was, it was just that, that trade-off. Like she always had to work. And because of that, I mean, we weren't going to church we were interacting we were meeting all these different families so and um what about your father what what you mentioned he got kicked out of the house so is that why he came to the u.s yeah so i mean he i don't i don't really like understand the idea of why he got kicked out um it's just some things you don't want to remember but he did come to the U.S. He started working within like the roofing, the as like the asphalt, not the asphalt. Is it the asphalt? Asphalt on the roofs. Uh, tar. Tar. There we go. Um. So he started working through that, and I mean, he was he was just like sun up to sun down. The only thing about my dad is that he's very like malleable. So whenever like his friends 
we're like tell them things and like they're having like a couple of like refreshments um they they had it so that i mean he, he was very impressionable and like there's some interesting stories in the sense that he used to have this mechanic that would always take advantage of him like he would take it he'd take his car to get fixed the mechanic would fix it but then he would put like a cap inside of like one of the pistons and that way like his car would mess up and he'd come again and he'd do it again and again without really knowing um another instance of that is like whenever they would get together like my dad's friends would like kind of talk bad about my older sister Alma and like he would treat her bad so like there's there's a little bit of like family problems in that mix but it's just because I mean he was he really cared what others thought so for that that really affected the family and so when you were growing up was there an emphasis in education for my mother uh, my mother she she bribed me uh, she she like for her education was key so we had a deal like for every a you brought me i'll give you five dollars so like for me getting a's was like a bonus because by like within like a quarter of like the year i could walk away with like 40 bucks so like i always strive to get a's it's interesting because like whenever i was younger and i did not necessarily understand the concepts of money like my elementary school years i got anywhere between the ranges of like c's to a's my middle school years, there were mostly A's and a couple B's. And then my high school years, there were nothing but A's except for one B in Spanish. And it's pretty ironic. I think that's typical. Well, it's, <laughs> it's an interesting story. But um, it's, we, she's definitely like prioritized like grades. And because of that, I mean, I was able to get a couple scholarships for like being top of my class and then having a good GPA. And it, it, it even made my acceptance to OSU a whole lot simpler. So did she do the same thing with your brothers and sisters? Mm-hmm. Not, may, not maybe like a ton in terms of like like offering them like $5 for every A. Back then things were like harder. But she, like they, they all understood the importance of like education. They were all really good at math and at writing. And it's just like we come from a family that, I mean, we're smart. So... We, we, we branched out into different areas, but we never really struggled a ton with education, mostly because, like, my mom, like, said that strong belief that education is key, so we, we always did our best to, like, learn and, like, get it done. So um, when did you first start thinking about coming to OSU, or how did you first hear about OSU? <sighs> um, I, well, it goes back to about junior senior year um uh, like there was talk about college my freshman and sophomore year because like the school itself wanted to prepare us for college but there wasn't like a ton because i mean like we we're ninth tenth graders we still didn't know who we were we were just trying to like be make friends and like survive not make teachers mad um so we 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 would we, we had this nice little bubble but whenever it came to junior and senior year like that bubble now encompassed what came after high school so originally um I, n I never really did sports and my sister always did sports to the point that like my brothers would like try to peer pressure me into doing sports so i eventually decided to to try sports and i got involved with like basketball um and then that really was what consumed my time but on the bright side i also had a friend whose name was george garcia um he had heard about this program because he was more college oriented he had more connections and he was the first one to establish communication with like the society of hispanic professional engineers here on, here on campus they had sent him this application about like this 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 event and like he literally went from like the library to the gym pulled me out of practice took me to apply i applied just to make him happy and then i went back to practice right not really knowing about like what came ahead well, it turns out that, like, my application was, like, accepted, and I was welcomed to campus on this event called Welcome Weekend, hosted by the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. Um, that year, it was me, George, Cesar, and another friend of ours called Moises. And we came, they housed us on campus, like, we had a lot more interactions within students rather, with, rather than, like, with faculty and all, all these people that like they're the PR they're paid to do PR 
we had more like the, the student touch and we met more people who were interested in similar like math and science were like the basis of it introducing us to engineering and it was just an awesome weekend it was just like it was amazing um so that was that was the first cool experience and then later on that year um i was salutatorian of the i, I mean i was salutatorian of the class um so our we were we were taking one of those computer classes that enables us to necessarily like explore different resources and like apply and this and all these they're trying to get you to branch out long story short so within that one like the the teacher had asked me and the the valedictorian like what are we going to do with our lives and where are you going that way like that can motivate the other people to get their lives together which is fine but it's just like okay give me a weekend and like boom so i i i, I started contemplating what i was going to do for the rest of my life right after that question um, I knew I, I wanted to go to OSU, it just made sense, like, my family, um, my brothers and sisters, they really liked OU, so going to OSU added a little bit of fuel to that fire, but at the same time, like, I had visited campus, it was nice, it was open, it was far enough away, but still pretty close, so it just made sense, so I just now had to, like, find a reason, like, an academic reason to go there, so I started searching, I knew I was good at math and science, so I, I, do, I did what any person would do. I did a Google search and engineering popped up and it had a list of all the different types of engineers. And from there, I just started reading. It described mechanical engineers working with like mechanical parts. Like, nah, that's not me. Aerospace working with planes, nah. Like, and the list went on and on. I even, I even covered civil and which it's pretty ironic because that's what I am now. But it wasn't until I came across environmental engineering that like I knew I wanted to do engineering. And for me, like the description read uh, like this dealing with a variety of different laws and things like that. But the part that really mattered to me were three words that were like environmental disaster relief, right? I was like, oh my God, that's gonna be awesome. So like at that time, like it was, it was pretty recent. It was like 2010 time, no 2009. So like there was, there were some things happening in the Gulf around this time in history where BP had spilled like a ton of oil into the Gulf and like there's ma major repercussions. And then there's like this famous commercial that came out by like the Don Company where like they're doing, taking steps to like clean animals. And from that commercial, I remember specifically them cleaning a penguin with Don soap. There's like this nice white technician and like they're cleaning this penguin. And then from there, I just thought to myself, it's just like, if that's environmental disaster relief, I can really imagine myself doing that for the rest of my life, even though there's a chance that penguins might bite. So like from there, I, I searched for schools who had environmental engineering. There was uh, a couple random schools towards like the edges of the state. I forget what they are, but um, I found that OSU had an environmental option underneath the civil engineering track. So like, okay, that's perfect. Boom, environmental, environmental, they're the same word. They must be the same thing. So I made my decision then, and from like from like junior year, I knew I was coming to OSU. So it, like senior year came around, I applied to all these different universities just because we had to for another class. But like once I got my acceptance letter from like Oklahoma State, like it was done, like it was set, like I knew, boom, it's I, ha I had I had sealed the deal right there, so I was ready. You mentioned that uh, because of doing well in school, how it it helped a lot with the mm -hmm. financial. So what kind of scholarships or awards did you get? They, I got because I was a resident of Oklahoma and my mom, and my parents didn't make too much. I got Oklahoma's Promise, which that one has helped a lot throughout the years. Um, the Academic Excellence Scholarship, which gave me $2,500 each semester, not each semester, each year for four years. So that was amazing. And then there was a variety of like smaller ones, like my freshman year. I got this $1,000 scholarship from like the Engineering Foundation and then just a variety of small ones. But like because I had the good grades to like back it up, um, it wasn't hard. Like it was like I didn't have to like hear, like wait for forever to hear back. They kind of just like opportunity, excuse me, opportunities just came in by themselves. So all, all I really had to do was just like accept. And so you mentioned that the uh your friend pulled you out of practice to to um, apply for mm -hmm. the, the program here. Can you tell me more about uh, what you learned in that two weeks about the program? Well, 
it was on a weekend, so it was two days. Um, but what it consisted of is, like, we came to campus, and we got introductions from, like, the different, like, staff and, like, the students who were helped putting it on. We played the world's greatest game of Mafia. I don't know if you ever played it, but it's amazing. And then it was really in the bulk of, like, Saturday that things really took off. They had Maria Diaz from the, <coughs> what is it, Office of Financial Aid. She was there. They had uh, one of the recruitment, um, what is it, advisors, not advisors, um, I forget what they're called, but the, the recruiter from like my area and they were talking to us from like admissions and then they had uh, combined with those two talks a variety of different like engineering based games. So we made a parachute, um, we worked on like, like a, little, a little assembly lines. They're like little games that were modeled off, off after the specific types of engineering so that we can like see what we like, what we didn't like, and like what kind of like areas we were looking forward to. Then we had like a ton of fun. So we had like a little bit of sports and like a Saturday afternoon, like we had lunches and dinners and breakfast together. And like there was just a lot of like one-to-one -one interactions, opportunities to like share stories back and forth. Um, it's pretty crazy because and like, I actually went to the program two, two times, one my junior and one my senior. And they had like similar talks, but different games and different people there. And like, and with through through in one of those, I met Yesenia. Um, she comes into play later, within like my college years. But I didn't know at the time that like the relationships that I was making on that weekend impacted my entire like five year experience here at OSU. So, um, as you were mentioning, uh, Yesenia. So, are there? people that you went through that program with the two years that you actually went to school during your time here with? So George, um, the one that originally pulled me in, he took a little bit of a different track. He first went to a community college and then came over here. But we're in school together now and he had arrived two years ago. So for my for my last two years and then this year, he's been there and he's, he's finishing up as well. Um, Yesenia, which at the time she was interested in engineering. So we both started off in engineering whenever I came in to OSU in the fall of 2011. And like, although her path has taken a different route, route in terms of like a major, she's still involved within like the Hispanic community and I still see her around often. Um, and then we have like uh, Jose Bocanegra, which he was one of the students who was like actually, what is it? putting forth the event like he was organizing it and then I came in and there's a couple years that we got a chance to interact with and then we even have like Cassandra Cortez which she also volunteered at the time then became future president and like she was kind of like my role model to go up to and then like it went from there so there there's a there's a variety of different like networks it, it was really like a nice little web of like support that helped me in different ways that I didn't really like foresee in the future. So what was the name of that program? Uh, it was Welcome Weekend and it was hosted by the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. And do you know how long that group has been on campus? <sighs> well it's actually pretty funny. Um, they're, they're two years older than I am and I am currently 23. So they, they've been here for 25 years now. Um, I believe from like looking them up through Campus Life they submitted their their application for like uh, organization in like October 29th, 1991. So they've been here a while. It's it's definitely it's definitely been an organization that's had a roller coaster in terms of like attendance and different like leaders and like they're taking it forward. So they ha it has some a lot of definitely interesting concepts, but they have been here for 25 years now which is astonishing. And what did you do with them during your time here? Um, so that really goes into, um, it, I started off within my involvement in high school, so I attended their events. And then whenever I came to OSU in the fall of 2011, um, they were actually the first organization that I sought out to like go join because I really enjoyed the weekend and like, I knew, like that's that was my connection to it all. So I went there and for that first year, I was I was actually like the freshman of the year member for like the organization. So I went to a lot of their events, socials, like community service, and like 
we were working towards a uh, welcome weekend again. I assisted within like small portions of that, but I was still moderately, moderately freshed. By my sophomore year, I had applied to be historian and I got it. Uh, there is some change in like the, the the structure of like the execs and I got promoted to secretary. By a semester's time, there's yet another set of changes and I got promoted to VP and that was my sophomore year. By my junior year, I was president. I held that office for two years and by like my senior year, I was Stuco representative for a semester. But then things really topped off in terms of like finishing my career. So I really had to let go of that responsibility. So about four years and a half of, of involvement. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting. So all, all the way through the, the, the food ladder from member all the way to president. So what's the uh, focus or mission of, of uh, the Society for Hispanic Professional Engineers? So overall, as like a national organization, they really want to like promote more Hispanics within the field of like STEM. Uh, specifically more towards engineering, but um, they really try, really want to like have more Hispanics in the STEM fields and like STEM professionals. That's one side. Another side is that they really want to help provide the resources in order for like those students to be successful. So they really want to be like the 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 counselor and the mentor to help people get there. But at the same time, for the members who are already in it, they also want to be the role models. For people to to like follow and look after, so it's a, it's a nice two two sided uh, path objective, but they they just really want to promote Hispanics within these fields that are so needed and they're so sought after and like there's just a ton of up, of possibilities within it, so that's national. Um, depending on the different chapters throughout the different uh, regions, there's eight regions throughout the U.S. Uh, we currently fall here in OSU within Region 5, we're called the Wolfpack, um, and we're actually one of the bigger regions, mostly because we have Texas, but um, we do, it, it varies a little bit between chapter to chapter. Um, originally, within like my freshman year, we had a little bit more social focus, but whenever I started going into like the leadership roles within it, I really enjoyed outreach, so for us, outreach became like a big priority. And then from there, we also added a little bit of conferences because we wanted to get that that national exposure and we wanted to travel, so it just made sense. And then whenever like I, I it, it kind of became that curve and I was stepping off of like the leadership platform, and they were focusing a lot more towards like socials and like inner member connections throughout different like chapters in like the state, because there was there is a chapter in the University of Tulsa, um, but it kind of had died out, but they came back. And then there's like a stronger chapter in the University of Oklahoma. So we, we definitely try to like do events with them to like unite us in terms of like different universities. There's a little bit of rivalry here and there, like a little, a little bit of like smart talk. But um, overall, I think in terms of like as an organization and a set of students, we definitely want to like help others be as, as successful, if not more su successful than who we are. So what kind of programs does uh, the society do on campus for students who are here already or for high school students? Okay. Um, it's been a little bit of a, like, a learning curve throughout the years. I know that for my freshman year, we tried to do a uh, welcome weekend again. And we had failed because we didn't put too much emphasis in PR. So we actually didn't get like any applications. We had everything ready to go so that was a little bit of a bummer. But uh, whenever we worked on it sophomore year, we had a small attendance. We had like seven students, but it was awesome. Whenever we worked, it on, we, we worked on it for the third year, we had 15 students, so we were making progress. However, on like the fourth year that we worked on it, there are some changes within like how you can house the students, and it just wasn't possible to have them anymore on campus. So like the event itself kind of like disappeared a little bit because of like regulations and liabilities within the, the university wide. So that was one of the bigger ones that like is tied to me. But then we have Noche de Ciencias, which translates into Nights of Science. Um, being that we have nice representatives from Dove Science Academy, Oklahoma City and Dove Science Academy, Tulsa, we used our connections to host these 
Science Nights Learnings, where it's like a two-part event where it's welcome to both parents and both to students. Um, there's a nice little introduction. There's food, of course, and then they split off to where like the parents are learning about financial aid. They have a chance to talk with like a financial aid consultant because a lot of the times they don't know necessarily what to expect or like how to pay for. What are some of these terminologies? So we focus within that area within the the parents. But on the student side, we organize these different like events slash little competition teams where they ha they have like a set, whether it be like building a boat to withstand these two challenges, building a parachute to like safely transport like this pod, um, or like building like a spaghetti tower to like, it's just these variety of different games that really get students just like thinking about like some of the, the, the challenges and like how to solve these challenges. But like on the same time, like interacting with each other, working as a team, and like really working together as engineers would do. So we really like push that forward. And then we bring in like a whole ton of like positivity and like just connections and like resources for the students, which is pretty fun and amazing. Um, if ever one of our other like sister organizations have one of these events, we'd send down volunteers to assist with whatever they may need. <clears throat> and then we have different like socials so we've gone to go watch movies, we've gone to like study together, we've gone to go do like the escape game in like Tulsa with another chapter. We've had socials here and just things that unite us. Uh, we also, in the third year, well my third year in, at OSU, we did uh, a service regional outing. So it was kind of like a, a, like a giant like social slash, comp slash sports competition, but like for like the entire region. So we had a ton of people come. It was awesome. Uh, we played sports. We had food. We did a little bit of dancing, get our groove on. And then, like, we just, we did some community service on, like, Sunday. So it's just, like, a nice social Saturday and service on Sunday. And then people split ways. We have the, the hotel accommodations ready for that as well. And then we have, um, we participate within, like, the Juntos tutoring program in Tulsa where we'll send a couple of our students to like go help them with like their math homework on like one Saturday through in a month. And like if the students really don't have any homework, then we just start talking about like our college experiences, like trying to give them a little bit of like more foresight in, toward, in terms of like the future. So it's, it's a nice learning experience slash mentoring opportunities there. And then we have these conferences, which in the past we used to go, we used to split and go to two different ones. One was HENAC, which stands for the Hispanic Engineer National Achievement Award Conference. It's a mouthful. But uh, we would go, it's usually held in like New Orleans. We went down there, sent a couple students. We got introduced to this concept of like the College Bowl, which is kind of like recruiting, but on like more soft skills basis. And it was like fun and amazing. Um, and then we also went to our national conference, which is like the Society of, Sp uh, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers National Conference. It's been, I've been to the one in Detroit. Last year they went to Baltimore. And then this year, I, I think it's in California. I think it's in Long Beach, but you'd have to check, you'd have to check on that one. Um, so we send people that way. Um, and that one's pretty cool because you, you're seeing like ship in its entirety. Whenever I went to Detroit, we actually broke a, a world record for like the largest Hispa Hispanic gathering at a conference in the U.S. So it's just like boom, add that to my resume. Uh, but it's 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 there, there's some pretty amazing things, and it covers a variety of different aspects. It just really depends on like if if we're meeting like our our, our national goals to like mentor and to like help students be successful, and depending on like what the chapter wants to focus on. So they can really go anywhere. So. Where does a lot of the funding for the for SHIP come from? So it's actually pretty amazing in the sense that it varies from chapter to chapter. There's, a, there's these different like pamphlets that they can help you with for you to ask sponsorship from companies. But being that we're in Oklahoma State, or at least within my times uh, as, a, as president and as VP, I found that there's a lot of resources and a lot of different like uh, funding opportunities within the university itself. So whether it be through Campus Life, the Office of Multicultural Affairs, the VP of Student Affairs, um, even our college as well, they're, they're doing a lot of funding towards different events and it's just a matter of like asking and like getting the right paperwork done and submitting an application on time. So for like the first couple of years, 
we actually got all of our events funded through the university. And then there was a little bit of fundraising that we did ourselves. Um, another benefit that OSU has is its relations and it's like working within like Posse, which is like our link to like the sports world and like express professional staffing, which takes up their like job parking requirements for like the football and basketball games. And then they staff people and they have a nice little thing where they will bring on an organization. You just have to submit a team of five um, to like a basketball game or a football game. You, de you donate your time in terms of like helping direct traffic and standing at like the gates and like preventing people who can't park there from parking there. But it's, excuse me, it's actually paid really well. Um, in like one semester alone, we were able to like rack in $2,500, which we can then like distribute into our different events so that we're making money as well and like putting it forward. And then like these other different resources are seeing our efforts and they're matching us. That way we can get the full 100% that we have. And then it also helps that the university has a foundation account that's dedicated towards like, well, at least in the past, it was dedicated towards specific organizations. But like, there's a little bit of change to make it now towards like the college itself where other, like a ton of organizations can like ask for like help like that. The biggest reason for that is, is that should an organization like perish, that organization is the only one who can extract the money from the foundation. No other organization or staff could. So by putting in into a general account, we can make sure that the money that's being donated is being used to like help future students. So there's just a ton of like, there's just a ton of support, a ton of opportunities, some amazing alumni that like really put it all together and bundle it and make it amazing. So how important was SHIP to your graduation to you getting through OSU? It was it was definitely critical. Um, to start off from like my freshman year, uh, my first week at OSU was actually quite horrible. Um, I didn't get the benefit of the luck to have any of my friends from my graduating class of 45 to come to OSU. I was really the only one. Um, my family was uh, a mile and 15, a mile and 15, an hour and 15, um, minutes away so I really didn't have them I didn't get the luck of the draw of getting like a fantastic roommate that would invite me places I just got one that was like peace I'm out I'm gonna go hang out with my friends um and he would just disappear so like for my first week it was actually quite lonely and actually quite like depressing and like there was a void um but because of that void whenever I saw like the pamphlet I decided to go and like ship was really like this the starting point from it all from there, again, if we think back to Yesenia, who I had met at one of the events whenever I was in high school, I met her there again for the first meeting of my first year for like the society. And from there, she told me about the Hispanic Student Association, that they're having this event. I had no idea what that was, but she invited me and that introduced me to HSA. From HSA, I then branched off into Student Support Services, okay, OSAMP, um, what would then become Sigma Lambda Beta, and then even just like more community service and different like involvements with different like staff that like it has helped me throughout the years. Uh, mentoring programs and it, the, from there it just like keeps expanding like a little web. But um, it, it all started because of SHIP. Um, in terms of like a leadership standpoint, um, SHIP actually comprises like a nice bulk of my leadership experience, mostly because like my freshman year, it was it was still going okay, but there's like changes that were happening. People were just like they they were tired and they didn't want to do it anymore. So like the organization itself, say we started with like twelve people my freshman year. By my sophomore year, there's only like six of us, and that was pretty much just like the executives. So that was a little bit of a bummer. But from then we were able to come back and like now. The organization stands anywhere between 20 to like 30 which is pretty good because it's just that curve and like there's now more people who want to do these officer positions because they appreciate what they can do within like the society so it's, it's, it's a nice little conduit so that like students themselves can like impact different portions of their community and I learned that throughout throughout it um just with the different like priority and like community outreach events like they're my favorite so I, I enjoyed 
the bejesus out of them. But um, from there, like, more people got inspired and things like that. So, like, now that I, that I was on my way out last year, then I was reminded of, of, like, how critical, like, my role was within the organization to, like, inspire other people to want to do it, which was a side that, like, whenever I was going through it, I never really imagined. To me, I was just trying to do something that I had a passion for. And from that passion, it inspired others to have passion. So it's it's a, it's a nice opportunity there. And then you can't forget just the the amazing sense of like traveling the world. Um, so traveling within like the US, whether it be to like Louisiana or to like Detroit, um, there were some interesting road trips, made some amazing long lasting relationships. And then from there, I got a chance to see different portions of like the US, especially coming coming from like Oklahoma, where we're just like nice huddled in the center and like we're just like planes, it's flat. There's not like a lot of dynamics happening there. It's interesting to see how things are going throughout like the different parts of the US and just interacting with different people from different areas. So it's it just builds on my traveling skills and just like my international perspective. So when you first arrived, I mean, you talked about how the, that first week was sort of lonely oh. and, and horrible. <laughs> and uh, then you started, uh, Senia got you involved with the Hispanic Student Association. Mm -hmm. So what was the Hispanic population like when you first got to OSU that first year? You know what's, what's pretty interesting is that my freshman year, I was actually part of a diversity floor. Um, I lived on 9th floor of Kurt. And to me, it was just like a regular dorm. I came to find out that it was a diversity floor about a year and a half later. It's like, oh, hey, did you know we lived in a diversity floor? We're like, what? <laughs> and we, we, like, we never really knew. So I, I really think that that really encompasses, like, in my opinion, like the presence of Hispanics at OSU. It's just like there were Hispanics present, but you just didn't know or like there wasn't just like a strong like community present. So you could find yourself living on a diversity floor not knowing that it was a diversity floor or living within like a community of like Hispanics, not necessarily recognizing that it was a community. So there is like, there is a need for like bridges to be made amongst us so that we can like continue our culture and like share our common ideas. But I mean, at the time, my freshman year, it was just HSA, which was the biggest Hispanic organi organization had merely 20 to 30 members and that was including the officers so we're really only talking about 20 so it's it's interesting to know because that's the biggest so you can only imagine with the other different organizations that there were just small populations it was it was, there was hardly any diversity because I mean with small numbers you can only do so much and then by your senior year oh by, by my senior year now HSA stands anywhere between 60 to 70 members attending a meeting. So, like, that can, that can mean that they have, like, 60 to 80 members throughout the year. But, like, now, we're, it's still the largest, but, like, it multiplied by four. And, like, the ship now is 20 to 30. So, it's just, like, now, now they're more visible. Now, there's that greater sense. Now, if you're searching for such community, like a diversity, you can find representatives just about anywhere. Where in the past, it's just, like, you really, really had to search for them. Now, you can just, like, start talking to people. More people know about, like, the Hispanic community, about HSA, about what they do. Mostly because us Hispanics love to talk. But still, it serves a purpose in the sense that you have just an easier access to like find these students and like become involved and like do some pretty amazing things. So it's it's definitely been a good change. It's it's a nice little exponential curve, but I mean, it's curving up, so it's it's fantastic to have that. So are there uh, different people on campus who had an influence? There were um we have a variety of different like staff members and different mentors. So the first one that came really like almost immediately was whenever I went to HSA, I met their, what would be advisor, Brenda Morales. Um, and she was just so welcoming that for like my entire first year, I didn't go to my dorm where I didn't have a good roommate. I just went to her office and just relax and like other people would come in and just like, those were the days. Like 
I got a chance just to hang out and we just talked about different organizations, talked about life, talked about events. And then, so Brenda was really just a nice motivational force that really pushed me on to more programs versus organizations, which came in crucial towards like the later parts of my years because I focused more on research. And Brenda was the one that first told me about research because I was like, Psh, nah. Like what? What is research? Like what? Like who? Who even talks about this? Like it, it wasn't like exposed to me, but then she introduced me to some people. Next thing you know, I'm doing research for my master's now. So it's it's a pretty interesting change of events. Um, with my interaction with Brenda, I then became became involved with student support services, where I met Justin uh, Morris. Uh, he's my he's my advisor, my my personal advisor. We talk about life, we talk about my problems, about my grades, about my goals, and like it's nice to have that to like remind yourself to like keep pushing forward. Um, in the beginning, it was like crucial because like he helped take my 3.2 GPA and like set it towards like the right, um, and then that was amazing. And then he he has helped me with like challenges that I didn't like know who to talk to. So it's, it was pretty amazing. From there. Again, Brenda introduced me to uh, Marcia. I think her her name is now Marcia Todd. I think she got married. Uh, she, yeah, she is married. Um, but with that, I was involved with the Inclusion Leadership Program, and that helped me like get experience with and talking about diversity, about inclusion, about just like what we stand for in general. And even then, I got experience in like hosting like a bigger conference that came amazingly well whenever I did Welcome Weekend for like my junior year. So that was my sophomore year. And then from there, um, it was through a variety of people that I, that I met. Uh, Dr. Sarah Mata, uh, which at the time, I mean, she was Sarah Mata. She hadn't gotten her doctor, doctorate yet. But um, she, she, was, she was my go-to girl for my junior year because it, we were, she was the advisor for a ship, I was the president, and like whenever I wanted to like talk about and get her feedback on certain things, I would just go to her office, and like that relationship helped out so much for that year, um, especially within like girl problems, because that's whenever I like I had like my longest relationship and all those things. So it was definitely a learning experience there, um, and then from there. Um, Going back to my sophomore year, I also met Kay and Farah, which introduced me, Kay Porter and Farah Williams, to the the realm of research and help get, help get me within like REUs and research experiences over the summertime. Go to Colorado, go to DC, go to all these like Texas, all these amazing different places to talk about math and science. It was amazing, and there's just been so many. Then we have uh, Dr. Jorge Atiles, which was my freshman mentor, which there was three students assigned to him. One never bothered to show up. One showed up for the first day and never came back. But I was the only one who has kept it up. And I mean, to this day, I, like, I still go visit him. We still talk about life. He tells me about his family. I tell him about how I'm doing. Um, he's concerned about my health, which is amazing because uh, it's a good reminder Although people don't necessarily like to be like reminded about their health, it's a good reminder to have. But he's definitely been crucial there, and then just the list goes on and on. And so, have you uh, during your time at OSU have you mentored others? I have, um, especially towards like my later years. So like my senior and my super senior year. Um, once I had like a ton of different experiences there, I was more well known. And I just had a good reputation, good grades, good career, um, good morals, good character. People came and they asked me for advice. We would talk about life. We would talk about differences in opinions. And then I, I actually also have two mentees. One was during my junior year. I had uh, Ivan Martinez, which he's like a business communication major. And... We, I got a chance to like talk to him about life here and there. Um, and then my senior year, I got um, Jonathan Nathan, which <clears throat> he's like an African-American student studying architecture, 
So I, we were able just to talk about like different struggles because I mean, engineering is hard. And like, I know, I know that we shouldn't complain because there's like a light at the end of the tunnel, but man, like sometimes it just sucks. So just being able to be there for, for Jonathan whenever he just wants to like vent is like crucial. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Like, al although now my roles are like are on a more personal basis, like I lead through like character and integrity and like other people recognize that. Like they've told me like, oh, I look up to you because of like what you stand for. I mean, starting it off, I mean, I did those because that's just who I was. But by me being who I am, I can now help others be who they are. And that's just a butterfly effect that you can't really calculate like the expected outcomes. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good feeling to have. And it's all been because, I mean, I've had good coaches who've made me a good coach. And now it's just... It's just a cycle that just continues. And so you mentioned earlier that after, like a year and a half after you'd lived on a diversity floor that you found out you were living on a diversity floor. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what a diversity floor is? <clears throat> so a diversity floor ties into the idea of li living learning communities. Living learning, co living learning communities are special communities within res, within res life that students can opt for to like better their experiences. For example, you have within people interested in like the Honors College, you have Stout Hall, which is like an entire dorm dedicated to students who are in the Honors College. So you surround yourself with people who are like you, who have your similar goals. Uh, engineering specifically now has two entire dorms. There's one floor that's special for engineers who are also women. I think they, what is that? I forget the, 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 the little acronym that they have it. I think it's like Mop Squad or something like that. Um, so it's just you find yourselves in, in these communities of students who are like you, who are often to have your same classes, who have your same values, and a lot of the times have your same struggles. So you find yourself in interacting with different individuals, like learning about them, about their struggles, and at the same, at the same time expressing yours. And like you build together as like a little miniature community within like a massive community. So within like the diversity floor, we didn't know it was a diversity floor, but we did have like Native Americans, African Americans, like Hispanics, uh, Caucasians. We had like everything, and like we would all like commandeer to, towards like the ni the nice little lounge, and like from there we we learned about different like challenges that different ethnicities or races face. So it's just like we talked about it. We like we went through this harsh reality of like college together and like for a freshman year, I mean like you're still trying to like just encompass it all in. So it's just like we were there for one another. So it's pretty amazing. So you mentioned the uh, the program that you what you wanted to study when you first came to, to mm -hmm. OSU environmental civil engineering with environmental option. And uh, so where did you finish at? So I finished um, my civil engineering with environmental option this last May, um, I got everything taken care of. It was amazing. Walking, walking across that stage was awesome. Um, the only challenge that came with it is that I learned later, later on that this environmental option field wasn't necessarily about saving penguins, but rather about designing water and wastewater treatment plants, the infrastructure associated with them, and just like the ideas behind them. So like working with like the micro microbial community towards like make sh making sure there's like enough hydraulic retention times. There's a little bit of like water hydrology encompassed in it. That's really where it, like it was focused on. So it's, it's, it's pretty funny. Um, my last semester I took this course called air pollution. In there towards like the later portion of the course, they brought in uh, like one of like the better uh, air pollution like engineering firms representative and I mean he pretty much told it to me told it to the class but specifically to me like straight was that like environmental engineers have two jobs they're the guys who help the government make the regulations to like calm people down and prevent like massive pollution but on the flip side they're the guys that help the companies pollute to the maximum maximum extent of the law our environment and like for me that was just like a conflict of interest because I don't want to help people pollute the environment I want to save the environment so 
with that, although I finished my civil engineering degree, I consider myself as competent as any of my classmates. And like, if I really wanted to, like, it would be a pretty competitive competition for a job. But the truth is, I don't want to go into the consulting world. I want to. I want to go into the nonprofit world. I want to do like something amazing, whether it be through research or through service, that would save our environment. So with that, like knowing that, I switched instead of pursuing a master's in civil engineering, I switched over to the master's in biosystems and agricultural engineering because they have a little bit more focus towards like stream restoration, water properties, and things like that. Concepts that I can learn. And take with me to a different part of like the world or even the states, and just look at their water quality aspects, and help clean it for the environment, not necessarily for just people. Which I mean, if I clean it in the environment, I'll clean it for the people. So it's two birds with one stone. But still, I I I have that 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 heart and that passion for like the environment, and like society is is included within the environment. So it's just it's not just humans; it's everything else in between. So you've started your master's program. So what are your plans for the future? So my plans right now are divided into uh, five options. Um, we have one being a research opportunity. There is the Fulbright program, which the Fulbright is uh, like a travel abroad experience that has really two avenues. One is to teach English abroad, but the other one that's more relatable to me is one is to conduct research with a different like host institution for like a year, six to 10 months, it would be amazing. Um, so that's that potential avenue and they have different connections within like South America. So I'm thinking Central Mexico, Ecuador, or even Argentina, Argentina is the last one. Um, I'm thinking about those three states, oh countries, not states, countries. Um, so I would really like to go learn about that. It's, it's actually really interesting because I mean, if you think about like Brazil and the Amazon, like, that's a that's a that's a crucial river for like the entirety of like South America, not just Brazil, right? And within like some of the things that has happened in the past year, I forget the name of the company, but they they dumped in a ton of arsenic and mercury into the waters, and like that has potential effects for like vast ecosystems for like the future. I want to know what they're doing, and I want to know how I can help, so that if something like that were to happen elsewhere, then we can learn from what happened in Brazil and apply it and prevent it somewhere else. I think, I think a similar case has happened in Colorado as well. Long story short, there's opportunities to like learn about like man-made disasters because I mean, we're all human. We're all gonna, we're bound to make disasters, right? But instead of like focusing on the negatives, we can in turn like focus on the positives. So that's why the Fulbright is so amazing to me because of that possibility. And then we have really two service opportunities which would be like the AmeriCorps, which would keep me within the States, but like in a different like city, or like the Peace Corps, which I can then go into like South America, be doing like simple things, not that like are too like knowledge intensive, like the Fulbright, but still they're essential to help like a community function and survive and be, be like to contribute. Um, so we have those two. And then the last two, which I haven't found them quite yet, but I designate these spots for like two companies who really do like conservation work. Because I mean, the interesting part about conservation is if you if you if you're a true diehard conservationist, you're probably not gonna make a ton of money. That's just the reality. And then the only time that companies that make a lot of money care about conservation is either if they're getting fined like crazy for something they did, or it in somehow impacted their future standings so I, I really want to find like a nice little company that's like in the middle that worries about the big companies so like bringing in a list at least a little bit of money but at the same time worries about the big pictures and it's just a matter of like searching for like what that company may be sounds interesting mm -hmm. and then there's there's always that that, la that last tangent i don't know if you've seen the videos about like these different like critical thinkers that just D devise something that like they can use to like better the environment for example in like south america there's this man who works with plastics he takes a lot of trash plastics he he molds them down in, into a more concentrated form and he makes these little little lego bricks and he makes houses for like the poor based off of the plastic right so there's a ton of plastic problem he made houses because there's a homeless problem 
he just he connected one and one together uh there's this other like brain child that was interested in fluid dynamics but was also interested in like the 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 trash in the oceans and he created this giant net in like the center of the ocean or well, they're gonna build a prototype and they're gonna test it but they, he created this this giant net that just felt like characterizes the waves of like the ocean and causes like the, the waves themselves to bring the trash over and like this net just like brings it around and it eventually just picks it up so it's just like a little dumping station for like our ocean that would just like get rid of the trash and like there's these australian i don't, I don't, I don't know what they are but they're like australian like engineers or like students who had the bright idea of, of creating this nice little portable station that you can put in docks and like water flows in, trash flows in, but the, because of a pump, the water flows out and this trash remains. So it's just these different like ideas that people have that like better our environment. So that's like the tangent possibilities because I don't know if I can make any money off of that. So. so are you planning on staying associated with the OSU? Of course. I actually, I'm, I'm working my way to becoming a, a lifetime member. Um, I really enjoy the, the opportunity to like so the option is that while you're a student, you can be, you can choose to become a, like, a lifetime member, which if you do it after you graduate, it's a thousand bucks. But if you do it whenever you're in school, it's six hundred, and you pay seventy five dollars a semester. So right now I'm at, at like I think four hundred dollars. I still have to finish the remainder, but um, it's just like I'm working towards it. And the biggest reason that is is I didn't become like an alumni member just to get free T-shirts or just to get these little promo things or whatever. I became an alumni member because majority of the money that I contributed would go in towards scholarships. And for me, scholarships were the key to my success because I didn't have to worry about finances. I just had to worry about my classes. And like, for me, if I had the opportunity to like make it rich and like create this amazing like scholars program, for example, if I won the lottery, I can pay off all my, all my, my debts, fine. I can, I can choose to invest in like this crazy house or this crazy car or I can choose to create like this nice little scholars like program that can help other students like be successful. And to me, like other people, whenever they, they went, whenever they went through it in the past, had that same option and they chose to donate back towards the school. And that's what helped me. So I want to continue that sense of community and that sense of like passion for OSU in the future. I just have to get rich first. So it's kind of like that pay it forward. Mm -hmm. Pay it forward. So, what was the most important or meaningful mm. event or experience in your life so far? Oh boy. There's just there's just so many. It's kind of it's kind of hard to really like sum it up. So I'm just going to pick one right off of the top of my head. Um about 2 years ago, um they had, well, it's actually pretty funny. My sophomore year. Let me add background. There's this program called the, um, it's actually, it's, it's rather, it's a scholarship pageant. Uh, it was, it originally started as the Miss Hispanic, um, Miss Hispanic Latina, Oklahoma State University like, scholarship. Um, and for the past, what would be like 16 years ago, it's been offered for women. Um, they compete and like, they, they're based off of character, charm, like, these soft skills and like if they if they win they get to represent their community and do some pretty amazing things so for for them it's been it's been going well it's been increasing every year and like it has a good reputation and just keeps getting better and better my sophomore year they had talked about the possibilities of making the first ever mister but there wasn't enough interest they actually asked me my sophomore year if i was interested in competing in this pageant and I said, nah, that's dumb. I'm never going to do it. Little did I know, given two years, my experiences had changed my perspective. And I actually competed my senior year because I, I had one more year. And I won. So I was the first ever Mr. Hispanic Latino Oklahoma State University. Which, that was pretty awesome in the sense that the year that came after, they did the first ever Mr. Asian and there was also like Mr. Black. So by, first of all, changing the stereotypes that like pageants aren't just for girls, like it's still like, 
academic wise there's still opportunity that you as a person can grow and pay for your school at the same time um we impacted other different like minority groups which that was amazing right because that's that's what we want to do we want to live an impactful life but on the flip side the fact that it was a mr hispanic we like it's it's nice to know that like with the the creation of the mister like the the once ideas of the whole masculine society within a hispanic community guys don't compete in pageants but like now that that opportunity is there we can stray away from that view and just be towards a more tolerant like opportunistic view so that was pretty amazing uh, i'm not gonna lie i got a, i got a lot of jokes from like my sisters and brother they they had so many jokes but uh, it was pretty amazing. It was definitely life-changing. I can say I competed in a pageant, which not a lot of guys can say they did that, unless it's like Mr. Universe or something like that. But still, um, I became like the first ever Mr. Hispanic. Now there's new opportunities for other guys. You just have to help change those mindsets. But that's truly something that like happens whenever you have passion and you dedicate yourself towards other things. You start going away from the things of the past to the things of the new. And that can really benefit communities, neighborhoods, society, cities, towns, etc. So what did you do during your year as Mr. Hispanic? Um, definitely community outreach. Um, I did a science night where I went to the local middle school and I worked with all the 6th and the 7th graders. We worked with magnets, with balloons, with like rainbows. They were super excited. It was amazing. Uh, just the energy and the vibes. It can, it can, it can really like do wonders. Um, I would go, I would still be involved with ships, so I would still do like the Noche de Ciencias. I actually got the chance to like design the game, which for that year was Don't Sink My Battleship, which was pretty interesting. Um, and I just helped plan it there. And then I was always involved. HSA, whether it be community service or a fundraiser, I was there. It, whether it be through ship, fundraising, an event, or even like getting things in like the paperwork and like helping the new president, things like that, I was there. So throughout my entire reign, I maintained what I was already doing. I just added in a new responsibility, but it all fit in within like my organizational bubble. I will say that these days I get a little bit more sleep, but it's, it's a sacrifice that's worth making. And so sort of on a similar sort of line, what was the happiest moment? Uh, that one's kind of hard too. There's just been so many. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to, like, isolate the happiest. Um, whenever I went Greek, that was an amazing, like, I felt so accomplished. Whenever I became president and, like, we got a chance to go to these different parts. Or whenever we did the SRO and I got, like, special recognition, that was amazing. Um, I would have to say, though, the happiest moment ha by, like, a majority of a landslide is just having people who you might have never like focused your attention on or like they're they're lower classmen so you didn't really have enough time to like pay attention to it but like people who you barely know come up to you and say that because of the things that you chose to do you changed my life thank you like that appreciation for being who you are that's amazing i would have to say that one and is there something, since you've been involved sort of with the different programs on campus during your time here, is there something you'd like to say to current or future Hispanic students come to OSU? I would have to say um, it, all boil, it all boils down to character, integrity, and energy. Um, no matter like what you're representing, what you're aiming to do, or like what you're trying to do, whether it be through an organization, or through your classes, or through whatever, energy, character, and integrity are the biggest ones, right? Character and integrity, because you have to know, like, who you are and what you want to accomplish, and, like, how you want to do it. If you want to be that student that wants to scrape by, that's fine, but you're going to have so much more work to make up for in the future. Versus if you want to be the student who's getting everything together, doing even more on top of what's required, you're going to have some pretty amazing experiences. And within everything that you do, you definitely have to like bring the energy because we live in a 
in a black, in a gray, in a white world, where most of it is gray. Um, you have your Debbie Downers, you have your Optimistics, right? So you being one of the Optimistics, you have to bring the energy so that you can sway the people who are just neutral and in that gray zone to like the white zone so that you can overcome the black. Does that make sense? So it's just like you have to put in the fourth, the energy to like make sure everything's planned and that the events happen. But like as the events are happening, that like there's that energy, that positivity and like the good memories that are also occurring so, so that the things that you that you start and that you work on get continued throughout the variety of different years. And I learned that through Welcome Weekend, through Noche de Ciencias, through community service, through Greek life. It's just like, I've always been happy. I've always been excited. Even about like these silly little jokes that are called dad jokes. Like I love dad jokes, right? But that's just like who I've become. And like that makes my days brighter. But at the same time, although my friends don't like to admit that they like my jokes, I'm pretty sure that they laugh inside. Whether it be like laughing with me or like laughing at the fact that I'm just so excited or, or just so happy about a joke like that, it brightens their day. So like it just makes the world that we live in that much better. Um, so is there anything that I didn't ask you about that you'd like to talk about for the interview? Mm, I think one of the, the, imp like, the things that I, I find that is on the rise, there's a little bit of work that needs to get done within it. But I find it really interesting within the concept of like multicultural Greek organizations. Um, I definitely admire the fact that within these days, there's more options. There's more of my friends considering to go Greek and like to build that community in a once predominantly white community. Um, so it's, it's, in, it's, I really appreciate where that's going. There's a little bit of tweaks here and there. There's competition, rivalry that kind of makes it hard. But I think all in all, OSU is definitely going from like a traditionally like white fraternities and sororities to more like diversity, like whether it be NPHC or MGC, like there's more minority groups that are also opening up the world for Greek life for minority students. You mentioned joining a Greek group. What, what group was this? So I joined Sigma Lambda Beta fraternity. So it's, we just, we go, we... We call ourselves the Betas. There's this Christian fraternity that's also called the Betas, but we're the multicultural Betas, and we do some pretty amazing things. What kind of things? Uh, community service, brotherhood events, um, sports. Just like whenever you imagine like your group of friends who get together to do things, like on like a more sociable level, that's my fraternity. So what's the focus for like uh, recruiting members? So we really focus on like establishing like the family away from home for like the students who need need that it's important to say that whenever you consider any organization you don't necessarily have to go greek to get that family away from home you can find that with just about like anywhere but you just have to be able to put in the effort too but we definitely pride ourselves in like creating that nice little community for people who need that support system we definitely pride ourselves on like our events and like what we focus on so different diversity talks different like things going on within the world uh, we definitely pride ourselves on like community service the amount of hours we do like and like some uh, some of the things that like we get a chance to like participate in and then we definitely pride ourselves on just like having fun I mean it's you have your academic world and then you have your social world and then you have your sleep world you it's 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 a balancing act to work within the three but like once you start integrating them like you can do so much more so it's it's pretty amazing all right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>